celebrate the current association meeting of the 2019-2020 school year. We're so happy you're all here. Hope you all got coffee. And um, we are going to start with oh, our agenda. Our agenda. Uh, so Father, I have Father yeah. Martin. I can go ahead. Okay, do that. Um, Father Martin is filling in for Father Matthew. Thank you. Um, we figure he's pretty experienced. So he's <laughs> We have a couple of our student leaders coming in. I asked them to come and really just talk about some behind the scenes of what's happening in student council this year. Um, and then Mike is going to speak on uh, an update on advisory. And then uh, self, there's been a committee that's been focusing on cell phone policy, and they're going to give an update on that. And then we have Crystal and Brian talking about balance of priority. And then we have some PPA news and announcements. Nothing like starting a Monday morning off the double topic sheet on. <laughs> we about another double topic sheet. We'll be starting a Monday. Nice to be here with you all. And uh, again, Father Matthew sends his uh, apologies because he would like to be here. But so, second spring, what the heck? Let us pray. Lord God, when you speak through St. Benedict, you say, you listen with the ear of your heart. We ask you to bless this day and open our ears to hear what is to be said, to understand what we are doing, and to be present in your blessedness. We ask you to bless each one of us and our loved ones, the things we are about to hear and do and see. We ask you to bless especially our kids, who are just the best. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good amen. Come on. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I have, I don't know if the students are here. They're here. Yeah, awesome. They're here. Yeah. Um, would you like to introduce them? Sure, sure. I don't know exactly what their positions are. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, members of our ASB, which is our student government. Um, they're elected officials um, here, so they have very important roles uh, in the school. Uh, this is Maya Blevins. Uh, Maya is the Vice President of the Student Council, and this is Bill Liu, and he is the President of the Student Council. So um, our goal today was for them to come and share with you um, some activities and things that have happened already that they've been instrumental in, in uh, planning and carrying out, um, and then talk about some upcoming activities, and also in answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so I will hand it over to, to them. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the first task for ASB this year was to come up with a theme, and we decided on Envision, um, mostly because of 2020 Vision. We were super excited to roll with that theme. Um, and also there's a lot changing on our campus, so we were um, going along with this saying, like, Envision the new Priory Cafeteria, or Envision um, a school year without Mr. Rolak, sadly. But there's a lot of things changing on campus, so we were trying to roll with that and go with Envision. Um, we also had our spirit week, which is when each grade plans out an activity and then the whole school partakes in it and they wear the color of that class for the whole week, uh, which was super fun. Uh, we really rely on the class reps to help us plan this and they did an amazing job, uh, so we're very thankful for them. And then we also had um, field day, which is another fun day at the end of spirit week which is when we get Amigos and Amigos out in the field, so everyone's super excited about that. And we have um, like bouncy houses, and then we always end with the tug war competition. And the seniors, I mean, I think we won, but the rope broke. But it was mostly on our side, so we're gonna go with the seniors one. It's, it's like the size of a bicep. Yeah. Your bicep. <laughs> It's not the size of my bike. Um, and then the last thing that we've done is our homecoming dance. And the theme this year was black and white. Um, and we were both amazed to see how many people actually participated. That was the goal. Like, I know you all own black or white, so just please dress up. And we were really happy with the student participation. Yeah. And now we're trying to look for values for our prom. And it's definitely like a really big thing for like the upperclassmen. We visited uh, three venues already up in San Francisco and we probably have some more to visit and then we'll eventually make a decision. 
And for the winter formal, which is gonna be in February, actually we're having the winter formal at the same hotel, Hotel Valencia. And we, we've already settled on a theme, kinda, and we're just trying to work out some interesting activity for people to participate in. And besides that, we're also trying to form like a stronger private spirit. We have a, an official ASB Instagram uh, account, and we'll be posting some information on the games, word polo, volleyball, and football. And we want more people to come to support and have fun together. And I think, we're, oh yeah, we're also trying to host more break activities, such as girls football game or boys volleyball game, so more people can participate and people can get, get like a different taste of like other sports. And I think that's what we're doing for the year. And if you have any question for us, we're also happy to answer. Thank you. Can you tell us what's the Instagram handle? Uh, WPS underscore ASB. I have one quick question. Do you do some leadership training? Is that right? Through the school year? Would you explain to everybody what that involves for you guys? Right. Don't you have a class or something? Yes, yeah, so we do. We have a class. It's called student uh, student government. We're in it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Mr. Morris and Wes teach that class, and basically just for once you are elected to be one of, a part of like the executive board of ASB, you have to take that class. In that class, we use the time to manage all the activities, manage all the events. Like for example, in the beginning of the, this semester, we spent like those class periods to make the, uh, the theme video, which is pretty amazing, I'll be honest. And <laughs> it's on YouTube. And also, we also use that time trying to work with each other, trying to like learn from each other, because all of us have carried like a kind of special and distinctive part of like leadership. And by like staying with each other, working with each other, working with each other and learning from each other, we become better leaders and bring more fun to the community. Thank you. Um, we do that most often. Um, 
We talk about academics as well, a little bit less. Uh, we do a little bit of goal setting at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of each semester. Um, we talk about organizational skills, etc. Seniors will be working on their senior project. Um, they'll have like a senior project kickoff um, is starting this coming week uh, for three sessions. Um, the last thing that we do is just plain fun. So we do activities where they're being silly. Um, we do um, an activity where, for example, one of the activities was make an advisory shield. We did that last year. Uh, what does your shield look like? Um, they have to draw a house. Two of them have to draw a house, and they can only do one stroke at a time. And it's, it's all about teamwork. Um, and what do you, uh, how is your house going to look, right? And what's the final product? Um, so it's about teamwork, and it's fun. Um, one of the recent activities that we did that I really, really enjoyed, we did this for the past two weeks, was called the Museum of Me. Um, and we talked about culture. And we talked about um, which, are, what are the cultures at priority? Uh, what cultures do we see? Uh, and they came up with great and interesting answers. So there was, you know, music culture, robotics culture, um, you know, theater culture, all of these different aspects. It's a little beyond what you might initially think about culture. Uh, so we had a great discussion about that. And then their homework, which they don't, this is only the first time they've ever had homework in advisory, was to bring two items that defined something about their culture. And so that's what we called it the Museum of Me. And they brought those in, and they explained what it was and why that was something that represented their culture an aspect of their culture. Um, I don't think we had enough time for everybody to finish, so it's kind of an ongoing uh, activity. And it was very revealing. It was really amazing. I, one of my advisees showed a drawing that she had done, and it was <coughs> fantastic. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and it's just, that's the sort of thing that I love about advisory, because it gives us an opportunity to see aspects that we wouldn't otherwise see uh, of the kids. Um, our upcoming activity, and I'm going to transition into something else. Um, our upcoming activity is on digital citizenship. So that starts um, this, this week. Uh, so this week and next week, we'll be talking about what is a digital citizen. Um, and one of the things we'll discuss is screen time. And we'll learn about active versus passive screen time. Um, and then how much screen time is too much? And how do you figure that out? And how do you negotiate something that you might not even realize about yourself. Um, so we'll be doing all of that, if you want to click over. Here's the definition that they'll be looking at on Tuesday. So digital citizens think critically about what they see online, understand the benefits and risks of sharing information, and balance screen time with other activities. But digital citizens aren't born, we have to learn. So now is a great time for students to be learning these skills. Um, are there questions about advisory before I segue? Is there any talk of extending it, or is the time that you have now for it probably most likely to be? Um, there's I mean, not... say with a sense that it's always so short, and I think it's a great program. Yeah. So there's not talk of extending it right now. Um, you know, we worked hard to get it into the schedule <coughs> starting last year, and we really had to carve that out. Uh, it's a great question, because ideally it would be nice to have more time in advisory. Um, it would involve a much larger schedule change, which in my experience is you know, several years in the making. <laughs> so so that, that's something that's, yes, part of the vision, um, but not quite in vision right now. So. Other questions about advisory? I hope your kids have been talking about it. It's, it's a wonderful thing. How do you evaluate how it's going and whether each group is actually functioning the way you want it to? Yeah, excellent. Um, so I always ask for feedback. Um, I've done small surveys. I usually, after almost all the activities, uh, send out a message to the advisor, how did it go? Um, and I'm always available for the advisors to come and talk to me, which, which they do. Um, and so I, I just I, I solicit feedback is the way I, I do that. Other things about advisory? I'm just curious, how about from the students? <clears throat> from the students? Perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have done surveys of, of the students in the past. Um, what I hear, word of mouth, basically. I mean, kids talk to me a lot, um, so I have kids in my office. Um, you know, if there's an issue with an, advise, with an advisee, I can follow up with that kid. Right? For example, if the advisor tells me, um, I can go and have a chat with him. Um, but 
I mean, from, from, the well, from both sides, I've gotten enormous amounts of positive feedback on it. So I hope your kids have been talking about it at home. It's, it's really a great, a great program. So I wanted to transition um, about the digital citizenship into um, activities that our cell phone committee has been, our cell phone policy committee has been working on. Uh, there are two members of the committee who are here now. I had them come in. So Wes Benick is, is the assistant dean of students. He's here. You see him every morning in traffic. And Michelle Reboff is our educational technologist. Um, so we've been working together. There are two other members. Michael Simon is um, the director of guidance and counseling. Uh, he's on the committee. And uh, Dr. Owens, um, one of our theology teachers, is also on the committee. So I would say we've probably met uh, at least five or six times um, since the beginning of the year. Thinking about our current cell phone policy and what are changes that we'd like to make to that policy if we need changes. So I wanted to share with you today, you're in the know because you're the first people to find this out. Um, I wanted to share with you today sort of an experiment that we're doing with the students in this November and in December. Oh, you already switched out. That's okay. So, the big reveal. <laughs> It is called Tech Free Tuesday, right? So the kids, uh, the ASB knows about this. The kids don't know about this yet. So it's, it's going to roll out this week. Uh, these are amazing posters that Michelle Reboff created. Um, that, yes, they're fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. There's no app for that. You know, people contact me. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, so those will go up all around the campus um, uh, leading up to Tech Free Tuesday. Um, I'll do, do a big rollout uh, via announcements and email. You'll see it in the bulletin ad nauseum. So what does that mean, Tech Free Tuesday? So two Tuesdays in the, in the, before the end of this semester, November the 19th and December 10th. What does it mean? It means the kids in upper school can't use their phones on Tuesday, on those Tuesdays. They can have them, but they have to be out of sight. So they can't have them out, right? Um, so they don't have the phones out at school. Why? Why are we doing this? What is the message we're going to convey to the students? What is the message that we're conveying to you? We want students to realize and understand their dependency, if any, on their phones. Yeah. Um, what is it like to not have your phone during the day? That's a wonderful question that we haven't been able to ask kids in upper school. Uh, we want to make sure we ask that. Take an inventory. What, what were your social interactions on Tuesday? Were they different? How did you, what, was your, what were your conversations with your friends uh, out on the square? It wasn't looking at this post, right? What, were the, what, what was the outcome? How did your social interactions change? Um, and finally, we want to create space for dialogue around responsible use. And part of that is what we'll be doing in advisory. We'll be having queries and discussion. Um, so on those Tuesdays, again, it's good that advisory is on Tuesday because we, we're, our plan is to get feedback from the students just through simple queries. What did it feel like to not have your phone, to not be able to use your phone? Um, tell us. Tell us about it. Um, we'll also do education on screen time, social media, uh, and digital citizenship. All of those activities uh, will come, will come uh, through advisory. I don't know if any of the committee members want to add anything right now or... I think you're okay for now. Yeah. Yeah. I should yeah. um, comment because I totally applaud this. I think it's fabulous. Um, at Sacred Heart last year, they did a week of no screens, so they didn't even have computers in class. They didn't have iPads. When you, if your child had a doctor's appointment, you had to call in. Mm -hmm. So no one on campus used electronics, mm -hmm. and I think it was really tough, but also. It got great reviews from everybody. So I think sometimes it can be hard. <coughs> you can still get your instant messages from your parents in the middle of class with you your laptop. Mm -hmm. So right. just if you ever want to take it a step further, it's hard, but it does. Right. It's kind of a cool. I've and speaking this. of parents, we're also hoping one of the pieces is we're hoping it's why we're letting you guys know now is we're hoping if you have the urge to send those messages yes, that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you call Trevor, there's phones in all of the classrooms. You're, even though it feels weird to, I mean, I'm a parent, I know I get a little like, I don't have their cell phone, oh my gosh. 
but we can still get to them. Mm -hmm. So Trevor can track and give a message to them, we can track them down. So we're hoping you kind of help get this message and, and yeah. support it as, as well, because I, I think, uh, I can speak for myself, I fall victim where I'm like, just a little tip. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we're asking, we're asking the adults in the community to model, right? Yeah. So model that behavior, right? Having your phone out, um, and and not to do that, right, in front of the students because they're not allowed to do that. So we really want people, want everybody to be on board uh, with not using the phone. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I think this is awesome. Thank you. Um, but I'm curious if when you want to kind of change behavior, I would imagine. I don't know what's going on at San Jose, Ohio, but it'd be interesting to check in with schools, say, for Harvey's been for a week or other schools and find out. I imagine the first time you do it, there's that withdrawal, and it's, but then you, you create your new normal after you do it for, so two times a month apart or three weeks apart, I don't know how much that will motivate yeah. behavioral change, and I'm curious if you've thought about Definitely. No, we yeah. definitely have thought about that. So basically, I'd like you to look at this as an experiment right now. Uh -huh. um, our plan was not to change the policy before the end of the semester, so it's basically something we just want to try out. I don't know what, what, how, how we'll advance on the policy for next semester. Um, you know, we will, but obviously I don't know exactly what that is just yet. We're still meeting, um, and so I could envision exactly to your point that we're, you know, we do it more often. Uh, that could be one possibility. pre -beta. Yes. Was that sorry? I said we're pre-beta. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that one week they did do it, Sacred Heart. It turned out that the kids didn't really miss the technology mm -hmm. as much as they thought they were going to, mm -hmm. and so they were anticipating this big deal, and at the end of it, the kids were like, actually, that was totally fine, and I got to talk at lunch, and I could hear the change voices, so it was this, it wasn't this draconian punishment. Right, absolutely. And so that kind of made everyone realize, kids are actually totally fine. This isn't a big deal to take away their phone. And actually, would, it, would, you know, it relieves a lot of stress. Yes. Yes. Like stress it stress about your phone. It was, you know? it was so, a really happy week. I think people don't realize the amount of stress that will actually yes. alleviate. I'm not sure how much time we have. Do I need to? Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, sure. All right, yes. Just a random thought just occurred to me, but with the, the new dining hall openings and maybe the new year? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a really interesting way to roll out? Like, let's just have this new tech replay. This is a beautiful new place. Yeah. 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 Like, don't even bring them in there. Just the box. Yeah. 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 These are great ideas. Love it. Great ideas. Yeah. 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 Ye
actually what they'll be watching on Tuesday. It's a video. It's from, um, yeah, Common Sense. Uh, it's a screen of how much is too much. I don't know if you have how much time it's too long. Yes. Okay. It's, fine. it's like a five minute video, but they'll be watching this, and, we'll, and, and I've generated some discussion questions for them to talk about afterwards. So this is our first foray um, into this. Again, the students aren't aware of this yet. Uh, they'll find it out this week. Uh, it's coming out this week. So you're in the know. You're the first. Yeah. Maybe we can even encourage them to leave their phones at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did think about that as well. Um, in the beginning, we said no phones at home. could have them at school. Yeah. Our only concern about that was that parents would want to contact their kids after school. Yeah. Sports, pick up, all that kind of thing. Uh, so we sort of dialed it back a little bit. Um, you could, if you yeah. want. Oh, if that's, wow. if that's <laughs> But that would be something you might want to try. Um, for those of us who live locally that experienced the first power outage, um, we had no data service, cell phone, anything. It was a blessing oh. for um, 48 hours. You talked to your neighbors. Yes. And all of the neighbors we were all talking about. So some of the children do have experience with it. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, so hopefully they can bring that yeah. input in. That'll be one of the things that we'll want them to remember, too. What was it like? What, yeah. How were your interactions different mm -hmm. not having that availability? Yeah. You know? So do you want us to not tell the kids? Um, you can tell them. I mean, it's it, it's fine. They're going to find it's it out. It's not a big reveal tomorrow. No, no. It's, I mean, they're going to find it out. It's not a big reveal. But, um, you can certainly discuss it now. I don't expect people to keep it a secret. Um, so you can. Better you than us. <laughs> Just a thought. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. years at the Priory, we've tried to do advisory on three separate occasions, <laughs> and he's the only one who made it happen. So. perspective, and then Crystal's actually going to be the big, th big thinker in the scenario. Um, it's been a long conversation for us, a uh, mission-driven conversation. Um, Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> ah! Maybe I should stand here. Look at that. <laughs> there are no clickable links in my PowerPoint, which you might discern. Um, so essentially what happened, so my balance here, uh, I'm going to give you a little philosophical overview and then a little bit of history. Uh, hopefully it will all be relevant. So 1,500 years ago, uh, St. Benedict <laughs> wrote a really concise sort of wisdom uh, tradition book that he used to orchestrate sort of Benedictines living in community. If you read it, you could run your family on those principles and end up okay. Um, and it's called The Rule of St. Benedict. In the rule, there's a lot of conversation about how you spend time. Uh, and it's pretty coherent and clear. The thinking is just as relevant today as it was 1,500 years ago. So, you know, prayer and work, that's a little bit of a different thing. But prayer and work, community and solitude, activity and stillness. And you're always thinking about balance as sort of a dynamic practice. What's calling you uh, to balance? Like Jung thought that symptomology, depression, was a call to a neglected part of yourself. Right? 
So listening for calls to balance is, is sort of a psychological exercise and also a spiritual exercise. And you can sort of put some of it into place uh, in structure, which is how we sort of started. Okay? How do we well spiritually, intellectually, and physically through balance, reflection, and care? You're thinking of wholeness. It's sort of the, the archetype of the mandala. It's a circle. Uh, you're a whole person, not a segment of a person, not a slice of that line. And you think about it as a balanced diet. So balance is the gravity in the Benedictine universe. What is calling you to balance? Interestingly, what St. Benedict said, so and I'll, I'll give you this one quick, 8, 8, and 8. So eight hours of sleep, eight hours of prayer, work and or, uh, prayer, play, and reflection, eight hours of, in his day, manual labor. He wanted his monks to work because he thought it was good for their spiritual life. Uh, and for their bodies, obviously. So this is sort of the orienting principle. Like, wouldn't it be ideal if this were the structure for our kids, right? Mm -hmm. So that is sort of a model that you can aspire to. Um, interestingly, and this is sort of relevant in my domain, and I'm sure it is in many of your domains too, is that if you spend more than eight hours working, it's egocentric. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, right? We think we're giving it away, but actually that's about us. And that's interesting when you think about it for those of us who work too much. Uh, okay, in 2005 I came on, the school's been doing senior exit surveys for a long time, many of you know what these are. These are one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, graduating seniors after they're in college and uh, after their spring semester grades have posted, the hope is they'll tell you the truth on the way out. The three dominant uh, rooms for improvement that first year when I came on were sleep deprivation, stress, and cheating, right? And they're not, you know, that's, that's a logical correlation. I'm overwhelmed, I'm exhausted, there's too much to do, I'm gonna cut some corners, right? And they were very forthright about it. Um, integrity is one of the five Benedictine values. Having a cheating problem isn't really defensible, so we went to sort of DEF CON 5. So, uh, yeah, integrity, except for school. So um, we went to Denise and Challenge Success over at Stanford, said, what do you do? She said, hit the structural first. She came, she talked to the parents, she talked to the kids, you know, was, was heavily involved with us. We were early in her program, so we've had a long relationship with her. Uh, she said, do the structural first, because there's no politics there. What you're doing is fixing bad structures uh, that are contributing to stress without having to negotiate with the teacher what's important, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that led to modified block schedule. ISM, which is a consulting group who does a lot of scheduling stuff, is still using our schedule as the model schedule which is really interesting. I came up, I have no left brain, it's a raisin. I went to Yvonne Faisal and said, look, I got all these cool ideas, and she said, give me a week, and she made the schedule. So if you see her, give her a high five. We removed the night mix of grad requirements, we instituted late starts for the sleep deprivation, longer breaks and lunch. Uh, we had candy bars all over campus and candy machines, soda machines, we got rid of that stuff. Instituted the no homework breaks, never more than two classes in a row. This is about the ability to pay attention. Uh, we put assessment limits. So as it stands right now in the upper school, uh, if you're in ninth or tenth, you can't have any test at any point, including finals, that is worth more than 10% of the semester grade. So you can't get too spun out that you're gonna have a two grade swing on the basis of one day's performance. Uh, in 11th and 12th grade, it's 20%. Uh, you know, we fought it. They said it's more like college, which is unfortunately true. Give them a bad experience now for a bad experience later. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of effort for that. No, it should suck now. Um, we instituted the online test calendar. We changed the semester calendar back in the day. This fall semester ended two weeks after Christmas break. Uh, and then you study the whole time over, over that holiday. Um, we enhanced the community service requirement, instituted that community service week. Matt Lye, God bless him. Uh, instituted more electives, started asking about uh, balance in the senior exit surveys. We evolved the mission statement. So it, just because this is a fun little vignette, I was pushing against the teachers and it was like trying to fight the Hydra. Like it would get small in math and then social science would go crazy. So uh, my thought was you go to the mission and then nobody can argue, right? So I went to the mission committee of the board who bought it and ran, right? And so we got balance and, and uh, meaning into the mission statement. Research SEL mindfulness and positive psych. Uh, the kids love chapel. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what faith, no faith, they love that time. Uh, and they love retreats. So we added more retreats, got rid of bells. Uh, we did homework value exploration, I'll talk about that in a minute. Instituted restorative justice as an intermediary 
disciplinary intervention. This is SLAC, which you may or may not have seen, S-L-A-C-K, uh, which is a student-driven, teacher-facilitated disciplinary intervention for kids to be able to reflect on their choices. It's intense and powerful based on the South African model. Uh, multiple, <laughs> yeah. Kind of, the good, well, yeah, not apartheid. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's my point. Spinning with inappropriate code. All right. Uh, multiple school wide services, uh, surveys and focus groups, homework and sleep logs, authentic assessment introductions, so you're not learning stuff you don't need to know, backwards design, which Chris will talk about a little bit more. This is organizing around it, during understanding these essential questions, and you eliminate the work that's not relevant. And it helps teachers not assign dumb homework. Because our smart kids say I cheat on stuff that's stupid. Right. Now they can rationalize stupid to a pretty extensive degree, but <laughs> um, student course evaluations twice a year so they can give direct feedback, the learning competencies and the role of content. Um, this is interesting, are you looking at skills or content, how much content is necessary, do you need to memorize the bones of the body at this point in time? Fun conversation. We have our counseling staff in quite a bit. This is right after the Atlantic uh, Monthly article came out about the Silicon Valley suicides and obviously action was called for. Double the faculty PD budget, there's a logical correlation there. We wrote the E4 grant. So just because it's an interesting story here, Tim and I went to New York City to pitch five ideas to John Gullah, who's the director of the E4. We had 21st century library, robotics, and whatever, a couple other ones that were pretty easy. And Tim's like, we have to pitch balance. And I'm like, if they give it to us, we're dead. Like, it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he goes, I think we ought to do it. And we pitched our first four, and I'm thinking, pick the library. <laughs> Throw money at that issue. And he said, balance is the only relevant thing you got on your list. So we did it. You get a $50,000 grant. You have nine months, one academic year, to raise a, a matching 50, or the money isn't released. We raised it in two days after the <laughs> So. Balance is compelling. He said it's the most compelling issue in many of the independent schools in the country right now, and that's who they serve. So, good story there. We visited a lot of schools. Uh, we hosted a colloquium here with five other independent schools in the Bay Area who had uh, progressive programming, like really interesting stuff. Uh, and we invited them here to sort of talk about best practices. And then, because this is a nice feather, NAIS, which is the preppiest on flavor of humans on the planet, National Association of Independent Schools, more bow ties per capita than any other reading 11 out of 10. Um, we got approved to do two presentations there uh, the year we got our grant. So very cool. All right, homework explorations. What they did is they did have kids do homework in class. What they learned is, is it takes kids radically different amounts of time to do homework. Um, and this is without distractions, right? If you're in Nancy Newman's math class, you're not looking at YouTube. Um, different sections, same class, doing units with and without homework, and then giving the same assessment. So you can do it with English 10, right? Or English Foundations 2, we call it now. So Kinder can take one section uh, of a class and another section of the same class, teach a unit, assign homework, the traditional homework to one group, and no homework to the other one, and then give them the same test. Uh, interesting outcomes there. Started a student yeah. no homework electives, opt out of homework options, which are still in play. These are complicated. Um, the EU and EQ lens on homework, which I already referred to. David Neal last year taught AP Euro with no homework, and the kids did great on the test. No homework. Like, that's really interesting. Super content heavy AP. So everybody's like, it's not possible. You assign nothing, right? And the kids did fine. All right, Seton got the way of St. Benedict. Benedict and Bells is not being compromised, rather is the holding together in one center of ultimate values whose force we must accept, not deny. What the Benedictine life can show us is the possibility of keep, keeping equilibrium in the middle of polarity. So that's the orienting principle philosoph pr principle. <laughs> principle philosophically. Uh, EE Forward, in their, on their website, this is how they're describing our work, which is we, we threw a bunch of spaghetti against the wall, tried a bunch of different things, and we had no idea what was having an impact and what wasn't. So that was the orienting principle for the grant. And balance defined. So this has evolved a little bit, but I thought it might be interesting because this is the starting point. So we had a balance committee when this work started. Um, and trying to define balance for our kids, to flesh it out a little bit from that Benedictine frame was complicated. And this is what we came up with. Crystal to give you an updated version. It arises from a sense of purpose and fulfillment. It's possible for those who feel valued for who they are. 
as a dynamic practice that needs to be taught, as a journey that requires time and space, it requires self-awareness and self-moderation, requires humility, perspective, and flexibility, and is ultimately a spiritual pursuit. Okay? This is hard for kids. Great. I think our initial pass, this is an adult's definition of balance. Mm -hmm. And what they've been working on now is trying to bring this down to a, a conversation that's going to be more resonant for kids. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's the history. Chris? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Crystal Yang Matsuoka. Some of you may know me as Crystal Yang, and others might know me only as Crystal Matsuoka. All of the above. Um, so, as Brian uh, talked about, there was a balance committee uh, that was formed after the uh, EE4 grant, after we got the EE4 grant. And they spent two years really doing a lot of the research and um, groundwork uh, for looking at balance, really understanding it, what it is that our students need, doing student focus groups, um, some of the homework experimentation came out from that work. And then uh, last year, at the beginning of 2017, they handed the baton to um, the PD group. So I, in my role at the Priory, get to do professional development um, with the faculty. And I do this with a team of really wonderful faculty members, including middle school teachers and high school teachers. So what I'm going to do after Brian's history is to tell you what we've been up to um, at the Priory. So, so this is a conversation that, uh, or this is in, in terms of my work, um, the beginning of 2017 was the first time we brought the faculty, the whole faculty, into the conversation that the Balance Committee has been ha had been having for two years prior. Um, and before I kind of walk you through our journey, Oh, I should put this in. Oh. All right, here we go. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a Benedictine quotation uh, that sort of represents the complexity of balance and it kind of echoes what Brian's already talking about. It says, balance is no easy feat. It is a line between stability and change, between obedience and initiative, and times of action and contemplation. So to give you a big picture of what we've been doing over the last year and a half or so, um, we are trying to operationalize balance and wellness at the Priory. So the first year, we spent a lot of time really just trying to get on the same page in terms of our understanding, understanding the problem, understanding what the balance issues were for our students, um, and then generating proposals. And um, you'll see, well, I'm going to walk you through that process, and a lot of the proposals will echo sort of all the different things that we've been try we had been trying for years, you know, including rethinking homework, including prioritizing content based on backwards design, etc. But this was kind of a venue finally that we had to formalize those proposals and really get things um, uh, moving, get, set things in motion. Um, in the year two, we this is year two. We are uh, actively implementing proposals to optimize balance. So. We rewind um, back to when we started in this Einstein quote about uh, you know thinking about a problem for 15, 55 minutes and taking five minutes to come up with solutions really um, was an inspiration for the faculty to kind of take time to build knowledge, take time to um, uh, build awareness around what the problem really was before we started slinging solutions against the wall. So we, um, what I'm going to walk you through is sort of that journey of trying to establish a common understanding. Okay. So this was a, I see Einstein again on the bike, and the bicycle uh, was a, sort of a, a metaphor that we used to uh, represent a more accessible definition for balance um, as the idea of stability energized by change. And I'm using Father Matthew's language here, um, in that this. The, uh, the bicycle represents balance as something that's dynamic, as something that something that is ever changing and moving, um, and uh, requires different um, actions from the individual depending on what terrain you are on. Um, so you'll see that by the post signs over there, that is sort of our journey of the first year, beginning with the why, establishing sort of why are we doing this, uh, going back to you know. Um, the work of the Balance Committee, um, the work that began with Denise Pope, and looking at what are our students really facing, what are we trying to do here. And then going to define uh, balance and, and unpack the characteristics 
of a balanced student? What is it that we really want to see? You know, balance is so different for every kid, so what does that mean in terms of characteristics of a balanced student? Um, and then really looking at the time and space and the real estate that school takes up in a student's life. Because, you know, me in my little silo of my English class, I think everything is valuable and I think that they should only be doing English. And I think um, sometimes we need to step out of those silos to really recognize how much time um, each of our courses, each of our programs take up in a student's life. And finally, the last thing that we did was to come up with ideas for how to actually address um, the balance issues we're seeing. Um, so, I'm going to now take you on a little walk along uh, sort of highlights of uh, our path to generating proposals. Um, so one of the things that we did, uh, what we started with, was reviewing data to understand our status. So we have a November uh, advisory survey that we're actually going to be giving very soon. Um, and it was first given in 2017 uh, through the Balance Committee, and there uh, the, the, the survey came from um, uh, research-based uh, national data sets that Adam Seiler actually put together. Um, and these are the elements that we were looking at. Sleep, homework, stress, time commitments, how meaningful. There are also other questions about you know, distractions, etc. Um, and just to give you a, a glimpse into um, what some of the data look like, this is a chart that shows uh, the comparison of 2017, 2018. And so you'll see overall in the left column that Students self-identified as having 10% uh, less homework um, and 2% more sleep, and yet 3% more stress, with the exception of 11th graders who you know, have felt like they were having a breather after 10th grade, I don't know, um, and international students. And international students thought they had a lot less homework, too. It was really interesting. So that's just a, a little sliver of the data. Uh, another thing that we did, um, was to get the faculty on board with building empathy for students. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when we first had this, started this conversation, it was an inclination for all of us to say, like, well, when back in my day, or when I was in high school, you know, this is the way it was, and we really needed to, to, to kind of look at, well, what are our students facing right now? A um, couple of different ways we did this was um, looking, we used uh, Challenge Assessor Denise Pope's pie exercise. Some of you might have been to her presentations where she has you divide a circle up into different pie slices to represent the amount of time that you're spending with family, with work, uh, sleep, friends, etc. And we had a sampling of students to do that to give us an idea of you know, how students were actually spending their time. Uh, we had a shadowing project where a number of teachers volunteered to shadow about 15 students throughout their school day. So these 15 students were chosen to be a representation of a diverse range of prior experiences. And the teachers actually followed the students throughout their day, throughout their courses, interviewed them about what their after school activities and morning activities would be, also to get a sense of what um, their days were like. Um, in terms of, uh, we also started having uh, advisory discussions to kind of pre-assess what, what do students think about this whole balance thing? What are their definitions of it? Um, and I have a, a couple of, uh, that was just a fun visual for <laughs> students. Um, so I have some student feedback highlights from those advisory discussions. So this by no means represents the whole student body, but uh, these are actual quotes taken from student reflections written in those advisories. So they said, or some of them said, a balanced student understands why you're putting in hard work, not worried about what doing what you, not worried that doing what you love will compromise your school work or grades. Okay. You're at peace with inner self. Okay. Has me time. Has a set of classes that challenge them to a slightly uncomfortable level as long as they still enjoy each class. Not a jerk to people. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> Empathetic. Isn't doing homework at break. Mm -hmm. Interested in all types of subjects, STEM, arts, English, languages, history. <coughs> Not checking grades all the time. We can talk about things other than school. Oh, by the way, this is upper school. I'll show you middle school responses in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking about things they can actually control. <laughs> Not college. Open-minded, emotionally, sta uh, emotionally stable, good communication with teachers and peers. And a couple other things they said, we need the 888 rule, which is what Brian referenced earlier. Balance is something that looks different to everyone, more of a state of mind. And we got some haters. 
all talk and no uh, action about balance and pride, brown balance is a joke. Everybody's entitled to their feelings. It's possible, just really hard. Um, and here are some middle school drawings. So we, we kind of adapted the lessons so that they would be accessible. And you'll see uh, over here. Over there, everything in moderation. So the one on the right, the, the representation on the right, is the one that's balanced. It's a little wilder and crazier. This was a seesaw. Um, I like this one a lot. It's a, uh, you can see, there's a school side and a fun side. And there's a person over here lassoing the kid trying to go the fun side. <laughs> of balance, balancing the population. So that was about starting the conversation with students, really empathizing with their perspective. Um, uh, along with that, we also had the faculty sort of unpack characteristics of balance during our professional development sessions. And this, one of the exercises we did was have them think of in, in small groups about what Students actually, what a balanced student actually looks like. So, um, you know, what do you see? What do you hear? What are students doing? What are they not doing? How do they respond to challenges, change, or feedback? How do they handle conflict? And in different contexts, right? At school, outside of school. Um, we also did a lot of learning for ourselves in terms. So we we had a panel of alumni parents come in to share their perspective of how their kids were. Uh, while they were going to the Priory and then how they transitioned since to college. Um, we learned about the adolescent brain and identity development from our own psychologist, Matt Wright. We also learned about the college, the reality of the college application process from our counselors to really empathize also with what students are going through when they, um, you know, take those steps. And finally, we got to a place where we were ideating proposals. Um, and this is where, you know, we looked at the broad categories of, uh, you know, systems and policies and our programs and also looked at um, things that we could do to help students uh, grow a, a more balanced mindset from the inside out, such as social emotional competencies. Um, some things that we kept in mind um, as we came up with proposals were um, sort of, we, we synthesized all that we had learned about kids so far through our empathizing, through our, you know, uh, unpacking the characteristics. And here's like a list that um, could be helpful. So kids who are balancing feel an internal sense of stability and agency, as well as an adaptability to change. So they feel empowered somewhat. They exhibit open-mindedness, empathy, and a positive outlook. They pursue interests and subjects they love. They exercise executive functioning skills and ability to prioritize and organize. They're able to manage stress, have unstructured time to play, have space for reflection and introspection. And again, balancing is a verb, or it's a gerund, but it's, it's, it's insinuating um, this constant <laughs> move. Thanks for clearing that up. who are actively balancing. So um, we, I want to share with you sort of our top proposals um, that we're going to do what we are working on right now. And you'll see that uh, many of them sound sort of familiar. They're things that we've worked on in the past or dabbled in the past, but we're really trying to be committed um, to these proposals. And uh, you know, right now it just looks like a list, but we went through a really, really long process of garnering all the different ideas that had been generated and then synthesizing them, kind of combining the ones that were really similar, evaluating them. We use like an impact and uh, effort matrix, and then finally prioritizing which ones are we going to commit to first. So first one, teaching social emotional learning and executive functioning. So this is again one of those proposals that um, we are, you know, we're trying out an advisory. There, there's some of this in theology, there's some of this in health, and we're trying to formalize it so that kids have tools that they need to really um, empower themselves from the inside and out. 
uh, rethinking course content load. So this um, is related to what Brian was talking about with uh, understanding by design or backwards planning of really prioritizing the most important co complex ideas to teach so that, you know, we're really thinking about what's essential in this course. What do we want students to know and be able to do 5, 10, 15 years from now and cutting the stuff that's not important. Um, and along with that, rethinking homework load is another big one. Um, there are a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of uh, variance in, in what, what, what teachers think are important to assign, right? So we're trying to get on the same page about that. Um, grade level and inter inter interdisciplinary coordination. This is about um, unifying a student's experience across a grade level so that they can see a through line, um, you know, in their 10th grade and it's not, or 9th grade or whatever, um, so that it's not all these little siloed courses where there's overlap. And, and no connections. Um, we're looking at the impact of AP and honors courses so that everybody can be challenged, but everybody uh, can be appropriately challenged. Rethinking the cell phone policy, which is what Michael shared with you. And finally, guidance on student academic and co-curricular choices so that when it comes time to choose your classes, they're making those choices as well-informed um, individuals who are being true to themselves. All right. So really, really quickly, do I have like two minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is our approach to professional development with the faculty this year. So the first semester, we are working in differentiated groups, so small groups led by the different members of the professional development team um, on implementing different proposals. So these are the proposals that we are working in small groups <laughs> on. And the idea is that by January, we've tried some things, piloted some things, discussed a number of strategies that we can come back to the whole faculty and make a recommendation and begin a strategic plan for how are these things going to be instituted. Um, some of them, like cell phone policy, it might be something, you know, we decide on something and we try it and then we come back and revise it. Um, things like, things like, uh, um, Homework and content load, those are going to be iterative and require constant maintenance. So the question is, you know, how do we develop systems within our departments, um, within the faculty, uh, and, and, and uh, to kind of continue to, to maintain and make sure that we are uh, managing the course content and homework load. Um, and then second semester, we are going to be working in grade level, um, working on grade level co collaboration to really work on the unit, not unit, um, unifying the student experience. Um, and this is related to streamlined norms and best practices um, around you know, LC learning competency, instruction, and assessment, so that students and teachers are working smarter and not, and not harder. Okay, so just to wrap it all up, um, this work has been really, really uh, interesting, intellectually stimulating, really rewarding, and really, really hard. Um, but the PD team uh, we, uh, and I have learned many things. So this is some of what we learned. So balancing is complex, and it looks different for each unique student. Self-awareness around our own needs and values is essential to cultivating balance, and so that difficulty is you know, how do we help students start to really know themselves you know, from the middle school age and, and so that they can appropriately make choices. Students who feel more empowered and healthy are those who see that they play an active part in making choices and responding to challenges. Our school must develop sustainable systems to support student balancing, but ultimately we must help students take ownership <coughs> over their experience. So school, we need to do everything in our power um, to create systems in which students can flourish, no doubt. Um, but ultimately, in Father Matthew's words, that, you know, this is up to students to take ownership over their individuality, right? So that they feel empowered, that they feel like they can leave here and make those choices for themselves to have balanced and meaningful lives. Finally, it takes a village. So how can we work together to support students in practicing balance and mindset? So one thing I can offer um, to you are some resources. Um, so the, this here is a TED Talk by Emily Espahani Smith, and I believe that the Balance Committee first uh, read her book, The Power of Meaning. Um, but this is a resource that has really helped our faculty ground ourselves in sort of the, the uh, 
pillars of meaning or, or the, the things that we should keep in mind as we create learning spaces and learning experiences for our students to, to, to uh, help them grow um, uh, with an eye for meaning and, and thus <coughs> that ability to create balanced lives. Um, this is a link up here, actually, the Benedictine Readings on Balance. It was uh, two years ago what we used uh, as professional development over the summer for our faculty. It's a PDF with, of a bunch of readings, um, mostly Benedictine readings, but also a couple of articles um, about, uh, modern articles about student stress and uh, I think social media, etc. So it's a short read and really helpful. And then these books um, are what we uh, we gave faculty a choice to choose to read one of those over this this past summer. So if you can't see the title, it says this big disconnect. So that one's about the impact of technology on families. Um, we have uh, Denise Pope's book, Overloaded and Underprepared, uh, which kind of has a great summary of everything that we are attempting to do here at the Priory. Uh, there's Rethinking Homework by Kathy Baderock, and then The Power of Being by Esteban Smith. So I will send this to Christy or, yeah, yeah and then that's that one of the links. And finally, I just wanted to close with uh, a couple of quotes from our monks. It doesn't mean okay. anything. Yeah. yeah. It just comes back. It comes back. Yeah. The Father Matthew says, balance is an interior experience that you grow into, cultivate, and practice. Mm -hmm. and Father Martin says, Benedict presents an ideal that is worth working toward, but he recognizes that it may take a lifetime. And so it does. <laughs> Thank you very much. So if there's other people that have questions, feel free to pass them forward. Um, I'm going to summarize these a little bit, just again, kind of the spirit of time. And I might ask, if you don't specifically ask the question today, if there's a way to follow up. Um, if, you guys if, I can, if I can email you and then I can share it all through. Um, I have a lot of questions, actually. So, <laughs> that'd be the great. So I think I will, I will, any questions that we don't get to, which is going to be most of these, but yeah. Crystal answer, and then I'll put a note in the weekly bulletin with the link because we videoed the presentation today, and then um, follow up content as well. If that's okay with you guys. Um, so, kind of following up on um, your previous slide, um, I'm going to again summarize this a little bit, but I think it's a really good question is if we as parents have feedback um, from what we're hearing from kids, what's the best way to contribute that feedback? And so, like, they included some topics. Things like school start for kids and music, the student voice and balance, homework quiz alignment, flexibility on homework, other opportunities. So as a parent, if you're hearing things from your child that has to do with balance, what's the best way to express that? Is it email? Is there some other? You want me to go? Sure. <laughs> uh, so any of those options are fine. You can email the teacher directly. I encourage that a lot if you have a question for a specific teacher. There is some trepidation about that amongst our parent population. If they are mean to you, I will manage them. So feel free to ask your questions. I also want you to encourage to have your kids ask the teachers those questions, particularly as they start getting into high school. Uh, parent survey at the end of the year uh, <clears throat> is going to be balance heavy this year because this is implementation year for us. That's a big menu. You can email me, uh, Mike, if it's extracurricular related. Uh, Crystal's running the PD committee. She's also the director of CNI, Cur Curriculum and Instruction. So if it's curricular, you can also direct those questions to Crystal. Will you just elaborate on what extracurriculars fall under MICA and you know, just take the So answer. pretty much anything that's after school is MICA's. And anything that's sort of in school belongs to Crystal. So like the, mu or the music, music is exactly yours, right. but the play the is, play is MICA. MICA. Yeah, you, you hate to sort of define it that way. If there's credits in a grade, and if it's fun, yeah. <laughs> Well, and that's one of the uh, questions as well, um, is really asking about, like, this is really great in terms of how it focuses on the academics, but um, how are we really looking at the kids with other activities, like if it's sports or play and, uh, and participation, things they may be doing that are not, um, specific to 
the academic day, and do you feel like you've got a good handle on that in this? Yeah. So actually, uh, to speak to um, sort of the whole student experience, this last proposal about guidance on student academic and co-curricular choices, um, the, uh, that is all about looking at um, you know the kind, the options that students have, that students have, and how can we guide students to kind of make choices around those options, looking at you know a calendar or looking at a, a, a sort of the. But when the biggest pain points are, so that they know what they're getting into. Um, so we, we haven't devised a specific strategy just yet. I mean, the, the first step, we, we did a sort of prototype at the end of last year, it was called the Crunch Time Calendar, and it was kind of just looking at, you know, can we at a glance identify, you know, if you're doing X, Y, Z activities and taking these classes, what does your life actually look like? And so I think we want to devise something like that to really help uh, students with those choices and on the other side of that is looking at those different activities and, and looking at what those are demanding of students in terms of you know I don't know time that it takes to, to do that I don't want to point out any particular activity but yeah that's Denise folks fine that's the fine yeah. the other thing that's interesting and whatever I'm just going to call it out because it's true so you know 15 years ago when we got to 350 kids we had a party right last year Applications were up 35%, right? So we have way, 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 way more kids than we could possibly take. We could talk to the tenth portal, obviously, see if they'll change your mind on that. But that is sort of where we sit. Uh, I think the demographic we're getting now is that kids, parents want balance, and kids, mission, and Yale. And Yale? Yes. <laughs> right? So there's a lot of dynamic tension in there. Right? So kids are doing resume padding, they're also trying to figure out what their passions are. You have to try stuff which we encourage them to do. At a certain point for every kid in high school, there's a point where they can't do it all. Mm -hmm. Happens to every kid. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. There's not enough hours in the day. And then you have to do some discernment, which speaks to Crystal's point about trying to teach kids to sort of identify when they're in a meaningful experience or one that's a little bit more strategic and what do you want to do with that reality. So. Well. Do you, um, one of the questions which I think kind of uh, answered, but if you could expand a little more, not just on from a college admissions perspective, but just even how we look at it prior is, um, have you addressed the senior exit survey feedback, prior to teachers balance, but rewards unbalanced kids? So are there other places besides just so looking at college between admissions? senior exit surveys and okay. I don't know if that was maybe. Read it again? Yeah. How have you addressed the senior exit survey feedback? Prior increases balance, but rewards unbalanced kids. Yeah. Are there other things that at the school besides college admissions being the only kind of metric? So that's not our metric. I'm going to yeah. be honest about that. Yeah. No, no, but, yeah. but for the kids' perspective, are yeah. there things that are happening at Priory that are metrics that are rewarding unbalanced kids? Like whether it's like Valid spending 100 hours a week on a sport <laughs> right. or on Reward. a, you know, yeah. rewards. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. things like that that are looking, that are not necessarily. So check, everybody's, whatever, it's an imperfect yeah. construct, to be honest. Chapel is where most of the kids get celebrated. And unfortunately, you guys aren't allowed to come. But it's pretty awesome. Like, they don't love it for no reason. So kids are celebrated in there all the time. In the formal capacity, there's an awards committee this year looking at sort of graduation awards. Do we need them? Right? Do we need any sort of shout out in that domain? I would certainly say that valedictorian calls out a kid who's worked really, really, really hard in a population of kids who are working really, really, really hard. The bulk of the awards at graduation are not academic, because I read them every year. It's community service, uh, you know, whatever, being a good citizen. Uh, so most of the awards, I wouldn't say that those kids, probably most of them are reasonably good students too, but that's not the criteria. But there's a lot of academic awards that happen in a little chapel at the end of the year. Chapel. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does this impact middle school? Because a lot of this is high school oriented. So. I think that in terms of structural changes, um, a lot of the middle school teachers, as we do with professional development, are like, oh, we got this already. You know, we have we have kind of the ideal environment. And I think the middle school um, what they've identified as their top priority is that SEL piece, is the teaching the social, emotional, 
um, learning so kids can be, you know, begin to kind of explore and identify, you know, what really is valuable to them, um, what is their voice, and to kind of build resilience. Because I think that we have, um, arguably, we have a lot of happy kids in middle school. Are they res all resilient? I think that's the piece of, you know, some of them maybe, and some of them maybe not. So I think that developing that sense of agency and that ability to you know, self-regulate and recognize their emotions and manage their emotions and then make choices, that's something that we would really like to start at the middle school level instead of waiting until 10th grade and then flipping out. I think the distinction is one of external accountability, to be honest. You can do anything in a middle school construct. The average GPA of a graduating eighth grader is pretty good. Um, and that's an interesting concept because they're not bound by any sort of objective criteria other than what they're accountable to for themselves. So Kate has done it. She told the teachers cut back homework and they all just cut it back with the exception of a couple, which you guys probably know. So you know, I have an eighth grader right now who doesn't like to do any homework at all, but it's very manageable. Like it's a very reasonable level, I would say, for, for my eighth grader. Uh, in light of the fact that he probably lies to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have a quick question, because um, I didn't get to put one in there. I don't know where my heart went. Um, but I've noticed with my four children, the stress that they have typically comes from the dynamics of the teacher more than the homework. Mm -hmm. So for a teacher like Mr. Trudell, who has a really tough class, there may be some stress leading up to a test, but when you start, you know, pulling with your child, they know so much from his class, typically, what I found, and I have children that have a hard time learning, that their, their anxiety goes down, where when they have a teacher that maybe is not as dynamic in the classroom. Maybe don't say anything I'm not going to say that. But that's where the real stress comes in, because then they go to the Khan Academy. Like, they're basically trying to teach themselves, I'm expected to pull something out or hire a tutor, and then I'm a little angry about it, so then their stress goes up. So I feel like maybe a little more professional development on teaching might help also sure. with the balance. I don't know, it, you know, I have no idea if that's even possible, but I do think, you know, sometimes somebody may have a PhD in a degree, in a subject, but that doesn't make them the best teacher. Sure. Now they can get there with some professional development that might help students, I don't know. Yeah, here's another reality, so after years of reading these, okay. because te teacher part is always the fun part, the juiciest. Um, I have teachers who are revered and reviled mm -hmm. Equally. Yes, I'm sure. And, so, and then you have some who aren't quite up there yet. And that's where our resources go. Okay. Which is, can you get there or not? If you can't... I, yeah, my thought was that yeah. maybe the balance for kids may also might also be improved by more learning in the class. Sure, I understand. That's good. The other thing that's true, for those of you who've been to the high school, the most stressful year in our schools, which is not the case of most schools, is Debbie Graham. Some of that's personality. Some of it's the last time the school's picked in sixty or seventy, so you only get to pick one. Because in eleventh you get to pick three or four, and in twelfth you get to pick five. Now they don't feel like options to kids, but they're choices. Ninth and tenth are hard, right? Ninth is a little transitional; it feels a little better for kids. Tenth, you know, there's some personalities in that mix, and also, you know, it's six subjects that we pick, and it's as far as you're going to go in some of those subjects. Um, so we actually, the admissions people need the room, so I'm going to do that. a really quick close. Um, Which is important. Two things. So would you guys just bear with me for two minutes. Just to wrap this up, um, thank you for this note um, from someone focusing our children on a life of meaning, maybe the most important lesson you put forward for them. Thank you so much. This is Radical for Silicon Valley and Transformational. So thanks. Thank you. So look for a note in the bulletin. So our, our PPA announcements, um, I'm not going to move my laptop back up. Cynthia has a gala announcement to start. So awesome. Uh, uh, so super So I'm super, super excited to announce our 39th gala event that is March 28th. So, so please mark your calendars. Um, I wanted to acknowledge Jennifer and Carolyn, who have been chairs in the past. And I'm very honored to follow in their footsteps and to carry on the tradition. 
Uh, very exciting news. Our theme is safari. Yes. <laughs> um, I tried to put on a few. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> work on my wardrobe. <laughs> we had a wonderful kickoff meeting, and thank you to Stephanie, who's our manager. So hopefully you'll get to know her also. So it's a huge help. And I want to thank anybody in the room who has already joined the committee. We definitely need more of you, so please, please uh, let me know or Stephanie know if you would like to help out, even in small jobs like sending 10 emails or calling a few folks to help us out. So um, just wanted to um, make sure everybody understands that this is about building community and supporting our students. Uh, so looking forward to working with many of you in the room, or hopefully all of you. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Susan. Oh, yeah, Susan. Um, hi, I'm Susan Carnsmith. I'm working with Sean and Hannah on um, uh, admissions, working with David Lazo. Uh, last October, this October, a month ago, many of you came and helped us. We had over 400 people come on campus that day. It was a record number for admissions. It was a gorgeous day. We showcased our gorgeous campus, our teachers, students were there. If your students volunteered, they get um, mission service credit. So that is my right inspiration to have them sign up to help us in November. Uh, our next open house is November 16th. Uh, we are recruiting more people to come help us, and uh, there's a number of different jobs. You can come for an hour, you can come for three hours, um, whatever amount of time you can give, we would love to have. Uh, we've got a fair number of all day. Yeah, we've yeah, been here all day. We've been here all day. Do you need students that day? Um, I'm not sure Buck Matthews is managing that directly with the students, but I think he's always looking for folks. Um, and there's, they help with tours. Parents are really just supporting the process. Uh, we're really trying to let our students drive as much of it as possible. The teachers are there to support. So even if you're brand new to prior and you don't think you have anything, to share, you really do, because you're just uh, sharing your enthusiasm for the school and your personal experiences. I want to give a specific shout out to, if you are a parent of a sixth grader, you are so important mm -hmm. at that event, because you are speaking, even though you haven't been here that long, you have a great feel for what it is like to be here. And our fifth grade, there are fifth graders now who are applying for sixth grade, they can really use your knowledge. So. Big shout out. If you, you are valuable, really valuable, even if you've only been here for a couple months. Definitely. And even if you know you're a high schooler but available in the afternoon to help with middle school and you've been through the process, and people will want to ask about high school experience too. So um, and I know some of you contacted me, you're unable to make it. Thanks for letting us know. Uh, you can do all of this through I volunteer. So if you just go to the priority website, log in, PPA. You can see the open house, sign up there. If you unfortunately can't make it, feel free to remove yourself from the list. That just helps us gauge the numbers, um, how we're doing. So thanks for everybody that has signed up so far. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna um, quickly say some thank yous before we, before I give ahead of the high school update. I wanna thank Cynthia for um, helping with our back to school coffee. Back-to-school yeah, coffee and volunteer fair and first PPA meeting at the beginning of the year, and Cynthia and Mark the DV for our uh, helpers, and so thank you very much. And I have a little thank you for our admissions people because you guys have been doing such a good job. So it's a little yeah, you're not totally done yet, but this will inspire you. Have my remark that which I will hand over to her. Um, our head of school transition update. So. You should have gotten a letter from Dom, the board of the head of the board of trustees or chairman of the board, and it was also in the Sunday bulletin. So if you didn't see the letter, you can go and look at that. And it basically talked about how we're in the quiet phase right now through our transition. After Patrick Ruff um, attends the board meeting in January, where the board of directors are there, then they'll move into a more public phase. But what we're very excited about is on March 10th in the evening, we're doing our third PPA meeting, and he is going to be our highlight. Mm -hmm. So he will be here, we're um, working on whether it's gonna be a conversation with him, or a Q&A, or it, the format isn't exactly formalized yet, but please mark your calendars, it's gonna be in the evening, so as many people can attend as possible. So, 
Great. Thanks, Thanks you guys so much for coming.